Uh, my name is Ben Goodstein. This is my second time at uh, LSC, actually. The first time was for a job interview uh, about five or six years ago for Apple System Specialist, which uh, might be no surprise to you, I didn't get the job. Uh, yeah, this did. Uh, as a result, um, I went on to uh, get a job at the University of Oxford, uh, starting off as a, a Unix systems administrator, but uh, with a very big Mac focus, and I'll get on to why that was the case. Uh, in a bit. Um, I want to apologize for my slides. And like Yanis's, they're not uh, super polished. I just came back from uh, a conference in Vancouver and I've been battling jet lag and the arrival of two new cats that I've adopted as well. So it's been all go uh, in the Goodstein household. Uh, I'm now the technical leader. I've also uh, changed roles. Uh, I'm now the technical leader for all things Apple uh, IT services um, at, at the University of Oxford. Uh, which might sound very grand, but as you'll see, I'm actually a very small cog in a very big uh, uh, load of wheels. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to talk to you about Oxford. Uh, I don't know that a lot of this will be relevant to your institutions, because Oxford is a very, very uh, unique beast. You can't be very unique, but it's unique, uh, extremely unique. Uh, it's made up of uh, 38 colleges, and six permanent private halls. Permanent private halls are just theology institutions where they, they learn ministry uh, and theology, um, all of which you can see here. And uh, they, uh, we have 24,000 students, uh, quite a lot, about 50-50 split, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate, uh, and 14,000 staff. And that is just what is employed by the university. That doesn't include people who are wholly employed by the colleges. Now, the colleges and the PPH are completely independent institutions who band together under the, the umbrella of the University of Oxford to deliver education. But they have their own budgets. Uh, they have their own vast foundations a lot of the time. I think uh, St. John's College has about uh, an endowment of 400 million uh, that it sits on. Um, and they own most of the city as well. They, they, in fact, own the street that I work on. And once a year, they plop down a fun fair in the middle of the street just to demonstrate <laughs> how much they own it and close, close off the whole street. So they're very powerful. Um, they are very independent, fiercely independent. Um, and we also have around 100 academic departments that I'm not going to list up there because that would be uh, interminable. Uh, but they are divided into four divisions. So you've got the mathematical, physical, and life sciences, humanities, medical sciences, and social sciences. And then you have the university's administration services. Uh, of which I am a tiny part over here, IT services. Uh, but you can see that all, all the other um, professional services that the university needs uh, to, uh, to do its job and to receive money and uh, stay on the right side of the law, make sure its buildings don't fall down, that comes under UAS. Uh, so why is it like this? Why is it this big, sprawling, uh, interesting environment? Well, the colleges came first. Uh, the colleges started off, um, the first universities were basically uh, rich-ish uh, students who would just hire an academic to come generally from Europe. And then they would take rooms in an inn uh, in Oxford. Uh, and that was the, the seed uh, of the first colleges. Um, so they were quite, um, uh, you know, they, they weren't very formal institutions at first. Um, but as time went on, uh, they received a lot of sponsorship and money from the church and became very rich in the process, um, which didn't make the people of Oxford very happy, um, which in a sense is why the university exists. Uh, we have this thing called town versus gown, which is now used to um, describe football matches between Oxford uh, and the university. Uh, but back in the day, it was a lot more serious than that. Uh, this is the St. Scholastica's Day Riot in 1354. Uh, basically, two, two students went to a pub in Oxford and decided they didn't like the wine. Uh, and they told the landlord that. And he was like, well, sod off, my, my wine's amazing. <laughs> and so they threw it at, at his head. And what ensued was a pitch battle between the burghers of the town and the, the students of the university that in the end left, I think it was 30 dead, for the townspeople and 60 dead from, from the students of the university. Uh, the king at the time, I think it was Edward III, found in favor of the university, uh, and the town has had to apologize, well, had to apologize every year 
by walking uh, bareheaded through the, the mayor had to take his hat off and walk bareheaded through the city until 1955 when they finally buried the hatchet and gave him an honorary degree. Uh, so you can see that there's, um, th there was a need for a body, a governing body, to kind of stop this thing from happening. Uh, and then the university was probably established around the, there's, there's no fixed dates on this, nobody really knows. Uh, you can see vice chancellors popping up in the 13th century, but it was kind of established uh, around this time in response to these fights. And actually an earlier fight led to a load of people going off and form, uh, forming the University of Cambridge. And they went to Cambridge to buy the entire city so that no one could argue with them. Uh, so uh, it's funny because Cambridge has a lot of similarities uh, with Oxford as a result. And when I talk at conferences and, and people overhear me talking, uh, most people go, that's mad. Why do you do things like that? The only people who come up to me and say, oh, God, yes, we understand completely are the University of Cambridge or uh, uh, other collegiate universities. Um, but then we're going to wind forward about seven, eight hundred years. Um, and this, this history and this, um, uh, the interplay between the colleges and the university as a whole um, presents itself to us in IT services uh, in a range of problematic uh, scenarios. So, for one thing, there's a lot of tradition there uh, in the colleges, uh, especially. Uh, in the departments, too. Uh, you're probably wondering why there is a mallard there. Uh, there is one of the colleges, All Souls College. Uh, every 100 years, uh, they sing a song and they parade a mallard around on a stick, a wooden mallard, uh, and it's something to do with something that happened when the, universe, the, the, when the foundations were built for the college, a mallard flew out, and so every 100 years uh, they've been doing this. Um, and actually there are, there's two colleges where the masters can see into each other's dining rooms, and since I think about the 16th century, they've had their chairs facing the other way because they had a falling out, uh, and that's, they, they still have beef. Uh, they still don't look at each other. There's so much IT support. Um, we talked about shadow IT, but this isn't really shadow IT. This is legitimate IT support uh, in the university. Every single college has its own IT department. Every single division has its own IT department. Uh, pretty much every single uh, academic uh, institution department has its own IT support uh, department too. Um, and we bring them together uh, under the auspices of uh, what we call ITS3, which is IT support staff services. Uh, which is a, a kind of a collaboration between IT services centrally and IT services out in the, the wider collegiate university. Um, and the, the colleges are used to being autonomous. Like I say, they're, they're really rich. Um, and uh, the departments as well are full of academics who think that uh, administrators shouldn't exist. Uh, so there is uh, a lot of tension there around uh, uh, us taking away their autonomy and their, their ability to make their own decisions by imposing services from, from a central point. And the university is a place of learning, and I think this is important uh, for a lot of us in education. Uh, we, we came into these jobs uh, because we wanted to be exposed to new technologies um, and to do stuff in an in a academic environment. Um, and you don't want to take that away. Who are we to take that away from these, these IT support staff uh, out in the, uh, the wider university? That, this, this may be why they were attracted to the position in the first place. And if we then say, oh, uh, we're going to give you the tools, but you can't touch anything, we, we own everything, uh, they're going to be disenfranchised by that. So over the years, um, organic solutions have kind of grown up uh, to uh, manage, uh, especially Apple devices, which is what I'm here to talk about today. But it, 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 it's true of IT services in general uh, and specialized ones, uh, which we still consider Apple services to be. Um, and it started off because units for whom we were the IT support, who had lots of Macs, needed something done about it. Uh, so you can see the Public Affairs Directorate who published the website and the, uh, the magazines. They traditionally have a lot of Macs uh, and they wanted easy access to, um, to shared folders, uh, printing, all of that sort of stuff without having to worry about it. Students Union, um, not sure why, but they all had uh, Shiny Max as well, Blavatnik School of Government, a recent addition to the university. Um, they, they made the decision to have Max, I think, from a, an aesthetic and a security point of view. Um, so they had lots of Max, uh, and uh, they looked to IT, IT services for some way of, of, of managing them, of having inventory, uh, of having some control over what was on the device. 
And it so happened um, that I was a member of uh, a group, uh, no longer exists, single tier. Uh, it was the Network Systems Management Service called NSMS in IT services. And we were a consultancy within IT services. So IT services generally provided um, things like uh, a Windows desktop, um, uh, access to file shares, and that sort of thing. But anything specialized, anything out, outside of that, like web hosting, uh, managing Macs and iOS devices, uh, that was considered uh, an extra on top that people would have to pay extra for. Um, the, the way it's funded is that people are top sliced, which means that part of their money is cut off for, to, to fund IT services in general. Uh, but uh, if they want anything beyond that, then they would have to pay extra, and they would have to pay it to our consultancy. And within that was a Unix services team, um, which I was a part of. Now, there is some crossover between uh, Unix and, and Mac OS, obviously, and iOS. Uh, in fact, a lot of cr uh, crossover, because it is Unix. Um, and this uh, was the approach that we were taking at the time, was to approach the Mac in a very Unix-like way. Uh, to, to manage everything with scripts uh, from the command line. It made sense that it sat with us. Uh, we were the ones who, who had the bash scripting and the Python scripting knowledge uh, to get that done. Uh, so way back when, way before I joined, uh, someone purchased Jamf. I think we were customer number four, something like that. We were, we were very early on, and it was sitting uh, on an, a Mac, uh, a, an Xserve, I think, in the, uh, the data room. Uh, and it broke whilst, whilst the person who knew about it was on holiday. And my ex-boss, uh, Marco, who some of you may have seen, Marco Jung, uh, he, he basically had to break in with the help of Jamf, uh, because they knew he was uh, a member of the university and he was allowed to do this. Uh, they helped him to break into the server, because I think it was deleting applications from uh, a load of users' computers. Uh, this is way back when. Uh, I don't think the people who'd set it up really knew what they were doing particularly well either. Um, and from that, we started to, 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 to provide services to, to users. But it wasn't a proper service. It was, an ad hoc, it was kind of an ad hoc thing. Um, we, we were like, if you have a Mac, you pay this much for the Mac, and we will, we will, we will fully manage it. But if uh, you think about the university in general, that's not a template that you're going to be able to impose uh, on all of these various IT support uh, units out in, in, in the wild. Uh, so we had to make some changes uh, and we had to make it more attractive uh, to those people whilst retaining our current customers. Uh, when Jamf introduced sites um, in Jamf 9, I want to say, uh, this was a huge boon for us. It meant that we could have a single uh, instance of Jamf, uh, which was multi-tenanted. Uh, all of these uh, units could have their own site within Jamf that they could have uh, management over uh, if they wished, or we would manage it for them if we, they were fully managed. Uh, and it, it meant that uh, that devolved nature of the, the university could be reflected in the software that we were using. Uh, we also adopted a Debian-like philosophy. So for those of you that don't know, Debian is a free uh, Linux distribution. Uh, we were all using it for our backend, for our infrastructure. Uh, and they use uh, three streams of software <coughs> So you have unstable for things that, uh, if you install it, then YOLO, uh, good luck to you. Uh, this might make your computer blow up. Then they have testing, which is where you think that it's stable, but you don't know. Uh, so you want people to test it, give you feedback. Um, and then you have stable, which has gone through that testing process. And if no, nothing has been reported back to you, then you assume it is stable. Um, and so we, we did that with, uh, with all of our software that we release for the machines. We make sure that when we are developing a package uh, for distribution, it's in unstable. Only we, it tends to be only us that are in unstable. Um, and then we, we designate through the JSS, through a, an extension attribute in, in Jamf, users, to, uh, users who want to get the latest software quickest, uh, but are supposed to report back problems uh, to us. I'm not saying that that always happens. Uh, but they go into testing, and then the majority of people are in the stable distribution. And we, uh, we, we automatically stage software through those three uh, different streams. We didn't used to. We used to do it all by hand. That was painful. Uh, so uh, we had to make some changes uh, to the way that we distribute software. So 
similarly-ish to, to DataJar, I think. Uh, we use a combined approach with Jamf uh, and Monkey for software installation. The decision to do this was made several years ago. Uh, Jamf now has patch policies, uh, which are a step in the right direction. Uh, we, uh, at the time, we needed to do this because we were spending, I think, about 11 minutes to promote one package from one stream to the next stream. Uh, we needed something that was way more automated that could, you know, give us time to um, adopt cats. Uh, so uh, we, we use Monkey uh, for, for software installation uh, now. It's a piece of open source software, uh, but we wrote some middleware, which means that um, it proxies the requests from the Monkey clients and then relates that to the, the JSS computer records, the Jamf computer records. And based on that, we'll tell them what software they need to install or uninstall. Um, uh, and it's, it's highly configurable. It's immediate. As soon as you make the changes in the JSS, uh, Monkey picks up the fact that they have a new dynamically generated manifest. Uh, and we find it works very well. Um, and we use Auto PKG for building the software in the background. We, we, use about, uh, we build about 200 packages nightly. Well, we check about 200 packages nightly. Uh, there's a huge array of different types of um, uh, departments using uh, our systems. So we have like all sorts of computer science software, all sorts of chemistry software, all sorts of statistics software. Um, and every night, auto package goes out, checks about 200 of them. If there's a new version, it downloads it, pops it in testing, uh, and then uh, users should be testing that and if they should report any problems to us if there are any problems. And we had to adopt a, a security first model. And that, this is at the heart of, of, of what we do. In fact, Marco, my previous boss, has moved on to be uh, very important in InfoSec at uh, the university. Uh, we don't like uh, imposing things on users uh, just because uh, a long time ago someone said no. Uh, we don't think that that's OK. Uh, we, we want to make them secure. Um, so we want them to have the latest versions. We force security updates on them. Um, but we try not to restrict uh, beyond uh, the, some simple things uh, that, that will actually add to the user's security when they're using the computer. We've heard about like, light touch policies. We, we adopt uh, a reasonably light touch uh, policy. We want the experience to be as Apple-like uh, as possible for the users. But uh, you know, there's a lot of important IP out there on uh, university computers. Security is kind of paramount to our uh, our ethos. Uh, and we also had to develop two streams of support. Uh, so fully managed is like the old model, uh, where we do all three lines of support. We have um, uh, a help desk, uh, we do the desk side support, and we do the infrastructure behind it all. And now we have tools for ITSS. And ITSS is the ITSS part of ITSSS. So they are the, the IT support staff out in the, in the units, um, and we sell to them a package of tools that they can use um, so they can uh, leverage our infrastructure, they get a site in the JSS, they can add auto package recipes to uh, package new, new software, um, and uh, they get charged uh, less for uh, the, per device, but more per year for the, for the whole service. So they, they, pay, uh, they pay more than the fully managed customers do uh, per year, but they, pay, like, they pay, basically pay the Jamf um, license cost to us with a little overhead for, for some admin. Um, whereas in the fully managed uh, product, the, the costs per device are a lot higher. Um, and this is just a slide that, um, that shows the, the way that it works. So if they are in the fully managed, they hit our service desk, our internal IT services service desk first. Uh, and if it, this should happen, but it rarely does, if there's a domain account issue, it should go to the Microsoft people who run the AD uh, or ADs. Unfortunately, that's another problem we have in Oxford that we have several different ways of authenticating users. Um, so they are supposed to, if, if they can't log in, it's supposed to go to them, but invariably it goes to us anyway, but uh, that's a talk for another day. Um, and uh, if they cannot deal with it, it gets escalated to, uh, to us, and we will escalate it to other teams if we feel like it needs to go there. Uh, but for the uh, ITSS people, they hit their local ITSS. They have a direct line to us. They do not have to go through the service desk because that's painful. Uh, service desks, talking to service desks is uh, a whole world of pain. Um, so for us uh, in this model, collaboration is key. Um, we are all members of a university. 
Uh, we are paid on academic contracts, um, and we, uh, we like to uh, collaborate just in the way that the, the academic university uh, will, would collaborate on things, both within the university and, and without it, sharing things with the outside world. We have an open source philosophy about the recipes that we, that we make. Um, but uh, within um, the people who are using the ITSS product, uh, they, we encourage them. Uh, we, don't, we don't package things for them. We encourage them to package it for themselves. We provide documentation, uh, style guides, and, and so on about how they can do that, how they can contribute. Uh, and if they follow those instructions, they can be just as effective uh, at uh, Mac management as, as us. So what are the pros to this method? method? Well, it's a very expandable service model for our university. Um, we have our fixed costs, which is three people and uh, a vCloud. Um, but the, uh, beyond that, we can save on the costs of uh, expanding our service desk by uh, capitalizing on the fact that there are already multiple service desks and multiple service teams out in the, the wider university. Uh, and deduplication of effort, which is uh, an important one. Uh, I mean, we thought about it. What is the point of uh, several uh, units within the university all writing their own auto package recipes, not sharing them with anyone, all spinning up their own monkey instance, their own JSS? Uh, this means that uh, you'll have huge duplication of effort that could be, uh, you know, way simplified uh, and free everyone else up uh, to do the, the, the real nuts and bolts of their job. Um, and it still allows them some, I'm not saying that we make them completely autonomous uh, this way, but it gives them that autonomy. It gives them that site within which they can uh, make whatever settings, policies, uh, configuration profile changes they want to uh, one or all of their Macs. Uh, and iOS devices, uh, and that learning is preserved. Uh, you know, we provide documentation, but you've, we don't provide all of it. You've got to go out and read the docs as well, RTFM a bit. Uh, and the cons, uptake is difficult. <laughs> uh, this should be no surprise considering the, the previous slides. It's difficult uh, for us to, do, to, to sell this as a service uh, because people like doing it themselves. Uh, we, we attempt um, to to spin it that oh, you don't have to employ, uh, you know, for the cost of one third of a grade eight uh, person, you can have a year's, um, uh, a, a year's worth of support for all of your Macs. Uh, but a lot of the time it doesn't, it doesn't land. Uh, there's still some suspicion and tensions between uh, these units and central IT. And unfortunately, enforcement is impossible. Even though InfoSec is a really important uh, tool for um, uh, encouraging uh, departments to, to uh, see that their devices should be managed. Uh, unfortunately, they can only really advise. They respond to, at, at Oxford, they respond to security in, uh, incidents and they do have govern, governance and policy, but it's, it's really advice rather than uh, enforcement. Um, they have a, uh, a set of guidelines that we follow uh, so that's one way that we can say, well, you are already baseline security compliant if you, if you have our product because we, we pre-check that for you. Uh, so conclusions, uh, <laughs> what were my conclusions? Uh, well, they're on screen there. So we, we face unique challenges um, and uh, when we see, uh, it, it pains me as a previous systems administrator to see duplication of effort uh, out in the wider university. I'd much rather see uh, one system that can be tailored to, uh, to, to local uh, delivery uh, than, 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 than multiple people rolling their own uh, or getting into the same problems uh, and not sharing that information with each other. Um, and uh, so that's why we've created these, these, these products. And for the people that use it, we have very good feedback uh, as well. We have, uh, they, 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 they like the fact that it, um, it frees them up uh, to do more of the other work, especially if they don't have a huge amount of Mac specialty uh, in, the, um, in their department. Uh, it frees them up to do other stuff, but they also get the technical challenge um, of writing recipes, of creating conf configuration profiles uh, when they need to. Uh, and that's about it from me. Uh, so I welcome questions about what we do and why we do it and whether we'd recommend it for anyone else.